Well, hello, welcome. All this light, I can't see you, so that's going to drive me insane. <laughs> so my name is Tina Front. I'm the founder of Courtney's House, and I'm a survivor of child sex trafficking inside the United States. Courtney House focuses on boys and girls here inside the United States because of my own experience. So to really kind of understand what trafficking is and why I do what I do in 15 minutes, I'm going to have you take a walk with me. We're going to take a walk through all of our childhood just a couple years ago. When we were children and knew everything in the world and all the answers and we were psychic. <laughs> when we had a drive that sometimes that we don't have today, right? When we had all these visions and dreams that we forgot about. So with that said, my trafficking situation started in Chicago, Illinois, inside a foster care system at about nine years old. So for me, trafficking has always existed in places that for some reason we don't think happens. If children are sexually abused, every day, why wouldn't someone profit off of them to make money on a child if they're already abusing them? Would they have morals and say, I'll sexually abuse them, but I won't sell them? Why would they stop there? So boys were also trafficked along with me inside the foster care system, so that would mean parents who were foster parents who get money for children and purchase them as well. So with that said, Let's talk about who I was as a child. My favorite thing to do always was read. I love to read. I love to read when I was younger. I would make these wonderful creative stories in my head. I memorized the books so that later on I could read myself a story and read it to the other kids as well. I also love to do games, make up games. And now I'm going to tell my age. My favorite game was Bozo the Clown. <clears throat> For the younger generation, you can YouTube it. <laughs> so with that said, my favorite part was when you line up little buckets and you put little prizes in them and you would just throw things and those are the prizes you win. Except we didn't have toys. So we won pretend prizes that were in the bucket. <laughs> but for some reason, I, I always won the pretend prizes. <laughs> and no one else seemed to win or I would quit. And so, <laughs> the other fun thing that I loved to do growing up was outside in Chicago, Illinois, we were playing on the steps, because our area was called Little Beirut. So that would be Afghanistan now, or Iraq. And with that said, we would sit and we would listen to the gunfire, and we would tell you if it's a 22, a 9, a 36. We would count how many undercover police cars, and I'm talking about the, inside the United States. How many undercover police cars, if they were federal, local, or if it was ICE agents as well? We would see how many raids they would do in one area, if we could predict it before it happened. And I'm about, I don't know, nine years old. Inside the foster care system, unfortunately, I was in many homes where people had a drug addiction. It was heroin. So I did not use drugs. I didn't use drugs because I had a poster board in front of me of what happens when people are on drugs. They let bad things happen to you. They're not aware of their surroundings, so I need to be aware of my surroundings. So things that we didn't know that we had the right to, food every day in foster care. Foster care parents get food stamps at that particular time so they can purchase food, usually five to six hundred dollars that we did not see. So instead, I would sneak out the food stamps and hide them and purchase food, and we would hide them outside in trash bags, and it's cold in Chicago, so it kept cold. And we would hide it outside. When you look back on things then, I was always being creative. I was always thinking outside the box. I was always seeing how I was going to feed someone at eight and nine and 10 years old. So I learned how to cook. First, Chef R.D. taught me. <laughs> but a little bit more innovative ways than just learning how to cook. Sometimes we did not have gas that worked. So I can make a mean grilled cheese with an iron and some steamed vegetables for you. <laughs> and feed everyone because I let them eat first. And whatever else was left over, then I ate. So I always had a foundation. 
It was the Tina Foundation. It was the only way that I would survive. One of the things I didn't like to do was steal. I had many friends that I knew growing up that stole food to eat. I always felt guilty about it. And then I would want to go back and give it to them. So that never really worked for me. <laughs> so instead, I talked to people at the back of the stores. I'm not into dumpster diving. So I asked people for food at the end of the night. I made sure that many of the kids that were also right along with me were able to eat. And again, I ate last. At 12 years old, I was adopted to a wonderful family, truly wonderful family. So I felt like, wow, this is great, and everything will be fixed right away. But that's not how trauma works. And so with that said, I met a guy when I was 13 years old who was 15 years older than me. So we're talking about adult men manipulating children. So with that said, it took a while. Just like any trafficker, please let me understand this. It takes a while. It's not all just kidnapping, throwing in the back of those movies, like taken. It's way more about getting into a child's mind, just like in domestic violence, when you try to relay that whole person is your world. But it's easier to do when it's children, right? Because children always think that they're not being manipulated. With that said, we also have to remember something very important that I just told you. I never had consensual sex. I told you at nine years old that I was also sold, so I didn't know what consensual sex is. So you need to really remember that because abuse usually happens as an ongoing thing for many, many, many years. It just doesn't stop. You try to bury it down within, but it comes out. With that said, I made the, met this great guy, and I thought he was just the most wonderful person in the world. Guess what? He grew up in foster care. And he was adopted. And after a year, his parents gave him back. Do you think that happened? It's a true question. Do you think that happened? It did not. But would a child believe that? And what is he doing? He's trying to find that one thing to connect with you. So we connected. He even told me how important school was. One day, I was running late for school, and he offered me a ride. Did I get there? Of course I did. He's establishing trust. So I got there just fine. And let's again remember that we're thinking like we did when we were teenagers. So that one thing that your parents told you that would happen that didn't happen, nothing bad happened to me when I got in the car, I got home on time, I went to school, then what do you think your parents are as a teenager? Liar. They don't know everything. They're old. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're 30. They're old. <laughs> so with that said, I started to trust him. Again, I have 15 minutes, so we're going to jump ahead on this trust. It took about six months. And guess what? He started telling me he had a big, beautiful house. I'm from Chicago. The house happened to be in Cleveland, Ohio. Very similar, again, to the domestic violence when they separate you. And he had this big, beautiful house. Did he really have that house in reality? Of course he did. He's a trafficker. So let's talk about that. <laughs> Yes, he did have a big, beautiful house. So how did I get there? Have you ever had a really close friend, and when you're really, really angry, you call that close friend, but that close friend tells you negativity all the time, the exact opposite of what you should do, and that's what the trafficker does. So I had an argument with my parents at 14, and the argument, quite frankly, was I couldn't stay up past 10 o'clock. Again, unrational teenager. So I was really upset and angry. So I called him, told me to meet him in 15 minutes, don't bring anything. Two things should, you should be thinking about in that statement. How teenagers think. If he told me not to bring anything, then I'm going to assume that I'm just really mad, and I'm going to make my parents miss me, and then I'm going to come back late, and then they're going to let me stay up past 10 o'clock. Because again, this is the unrational thinking of a teenager. The reality is I did not think that I was going to be taken out of state. I even asked if I can go back home, and that did not happen. When I did get to Cleveland, Ohio, there were three other girls, I'm sorry, four other girls who were all under the age of 18 because the average age of entering and forced prostitution is 12 to 14. One thing that he did do was drink all the time, and he would make the other girls drink as well. 
one of my things is staying attention, paying attention to my surroundings. So actually, what I did was put a little bit of alcohol on my tongue so it smelled like liquor. When he wasn't looking and the other girls wasn't, I would pour little bits and pieces back into their cup, his cup, and into the bottle. Is that not thinking outside the box? <laughs> It was so I can be aware of my surroundings and I can try my best to control things that I could not control. With that said, he locked us in the house with a dead boat lock. So I would sneak the key and I stole it once and made an extra copy and put the other one back. And I would unlock the door when he was beating the other girls just in case we had to run out. And that happened and we had to run out and he caught me. Although I got beat many times, I tried many different ways to get away. Unfortunately, my escape was juvenile detention at 15. I was charged with, force, with prostitution, and he was not. Nothing ever happened to him. So when we're thinking about thinking outside the box, it's my life. <laughs> Working with the survivors in the street outreach that we currently do at Courtney's house, I pay attention to detail on the street, totally different than what you think street outreach is. We're paying attention that there are no traffickers there. We're paying attention of the people who watch the girls. We don't get harassed because I teach a skill that I always had. When you try to turn your life around at times, and we all have, we try to get rid of the things that we think are negative instead of turning it into something that is positive. These are all skills that I always had that I didn't think I can use in this world, that I didn't think people would actually pay attention to me. And instead of changing who I was, I changed the way I thought and did it in a positive way. All these skills is exactly what I use today to run Courtney's house, how we get houses donated, how we get all the services, everything in our drop-in center donated. And it's all used from my own background. How we get food is how I got food to eat, asking. How we work with our survivors now, instead of calling it a treatment program, a treatment plan, instead it's our positive hustle plan. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, one of our survivors told me the other day when we were walking down the street and she was telling me how she threw her bags outside and she threw clothes outside to hide so she can escape from the trafficker. And I said, you know what? I'm so proud of you because you're a strategic planner. <laughs> <laughs> so today, I wanted to thank you all for listening to me, but to also understand that what happened to me was not all negative. It's the positive of who I am today. I couldn't be able to help as many people the way we do and be successful if I was inside a little teeny tiny box saying this is the only way that we can do things. Thank you so much for listening to me today.